art, the Bulldog's spirit and skills surface when he's in trouble. He led the tour in sand saves in 1994 by getting up and down out of bunkers 65% of the time. And of course, who could forget the shot heard round the world? Three-time sand saves leader on the PGA Tour, Paul Azinger will always be remembered for his spectacular finish at the 1993 Memorial. Oh, yes! Another young professional with a vivid imagination, 26-year-old Phil Mickelson. He already has eight tour victories. The short of it, he is the master at the flop shot. Now this is, Kenny, the same angle we saw Norman a moment ago. Norman elected to bump and run it into the slope. Mickelson, Mickelson will not bump and right. run it. No. He, look at that, no. he's got it, he will flop it. Look at this. Just shaves it right underneath. Masterful by Mickelson. While short game skills are crucial for scoring on the PGA Tour, putting is often the difference between contending and finishing deep in the pack. Only five foot nine and 150 pounds, Corey Faven doesn't come up short with the short stick. But the gold medal for putting would have to hang around Ben Crenshaw's neck. He and his trusty blade, Gentle Ben, have putted their way to victory 19 times, including two Masters tournaments. Tour pros understand the importance of the short game, and anyone who continues to work hard at mastering this skill will eventually earn a gold medal. John, you're known primarily as a big, heavy hitter. For those of us who will never hit the ball 300 yards, give us an idea of what that feels like. Well, when it goes straight, it feels good. When it goes crooked, it doesn't do you too good. <laughs> well, just like in basketball, we love to watch the slam dunks. We also like to watch the big bangers. So let's uh, join John and watch some of them. When it comes to thrilling a gallery, nothing beats a big hitter. John Daly draws huge crowds because of his trademark grip it and rip it drives. Look at this, folks. It could be. Oh my gosh. I've never Almost seen like a it. double eagle. It's no wonder that driving fascinates fans, because among all sports, golf would easily take the gold medal for distance. Hitting a golf ball upwards of 300 yards with one powerful swing is a sensation felt by only a select few. I'm sure a baseball player has the same sensation. When you really catch one in the middle of the club face, you almost don't even feel the ball. It just kind of jumps off there so much that you know you've caught it really good. It's really hard to hard to feel. I, you hit a good one, and and you know you hit you've hit it well because you don't feel anything. It feels like the club goes through, and it just swings nice and easy, and 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 the ball just comes off without much feeling. I think that that's when I really know I've hit one really long. When I start hitting it, uh, hitting it far, my timing's on. It feels actually more effortless. And you can hit it long, Kenny <laughs> Because effortless power is the desired sensation, the long hitters deliver distance, not by trying to crush the ball, but by letting the club do the work. I could swing a heck of a lot harder if I wanted to, but if I swung that hard, I definitely wouldn't have any accuracy at all because I'd lose my balance, and therefore my timing would be off. I usually overswing anyway, so I work on hitting the ball solid. I usually make a reasonable swing, and then I get all the club head speed that I'm using right on the ball, and that seems to work the best for me. Just think about hitting it solid and hitting it solid. If you get too quick, you're gonna lose some of that energy. If you stay you know, limber and relaxed and you're able to strike at, you know, at impact, well, you can strike in a long way. And, and 
if you have balance and you have consistency and a smooth falling swing, you can get some accuracy as well. That combination of distance and accuracy can give a strong driver an advantage. Definitely, it can help. If, you know, obviously, if you hit the ball in the fairway and, and get it down in there where you can reach a par five or have a little bit easier shot than, than the other guy. Daly's distance has its advantages, but John downplays the intimidation factor of blowing past his playing partners. Really, the only advantage I have is, is some on a lot of par fives and, and uh, maybe cut some dog legs on some par fours. But when it comes to playing with the guys out here, it, it doesn't affect them at all. Uh, they're two, two strong competitors, and um, they always play within themselves. Accurate ball striking can make up for a lack of distance, but let's face it, blasting one 300 yards still looks like more fun. John Daly gets all the hype, but statistically speaking, this guy right here, John Adams, is the tour's longest hitter. John, any uh, keys for hitting the long drive for those weekend golfers? Well, um, basically, I've just, I, I try to not swing too hard until the last minute. I don't swing too hard from the top. I, I start down sort of slow, and then I let it gradually pick up, uh, pick up speed, and I'm real happy with the equipment I'm using right now, too. And you don't think too much about it, I take it. No, Just get out and do it. Yeah, you don't think too much. Uh, you do when you're not hitting it well, but you know when you're satisfied, you've got a driver you like, your tempo's going good, you can hit it a long way. Statistically, he's the longest. How they get those stats, that's a story in itself. The PGA Tour keeps 10 official statistical categories to measure each facet of the game. Driving distance is measured by volunteer scorers after the rules officials have marked two holes. Okay, we're measuring today the, the uh, two holes on the golf course for the driving distance. We measure two holes on the golf course that are in opposite directions to take the wind in consideration. We measure out there 220 and we go in increments of 10 to about 340 for the driving statistic. I got Don Wallace out there, he's going to stop at 220. I'm going to measure with this laser device to get him there and we're going to do the marks from there. Come in, Don. Yep. Go ahead. All right, Don, that's 215. How about backing up five paces? Going back five. All right, that's perfect. 220 right there. Mark it. Marking 220. But as the long drivers mentioned earlier, distance isn't everything. A player's driving distance rank combined with his driving accuracy rank creates the total driving category. The total driving leaders usually balance both distance and accuracy, rather than stand out in one or the other. Total driving, that's a very important stat because not only do you have the ability to hit the ball a decent distance, but you also can hit the ball in play all the time. Scoring often depends on a hot putter, which is why the putting leaders are envied. It's important to note that the putting average is figured only on holes where a player hits the green in regulation. As a result, the conservative player who often hits to the middle of greens in two putts would rank lower than an aggressive player who either hits it close or misses the green completely. A misleading stat maybe, but still closely watched. If I'm going to be down the bottom on greens and regulation and driving fairways hit or whatever, but if I'm up there and putting, that's all that matters. Because it's, uh, that's where you make all the money. Drive for show and putt for dough. Putting may be important, but the most comprehensive stat is the all-around category, which adds up a player's rankings in the other nine areas. The lower the total, the better the player's all-around standing. Studying the stats can help a player pinpoint where he needs to improve to move up on the all-important stat, the money list. I think there's an adage on it. I first came out to a guy said, if you always strive to improve your weakest part of your game, you're going to probably continue to improve your golf game and move up the ladder. I think that's pretty good, good advice. Everybody, even the, Brian, over here. Oh, yeah, over, over down here. Yeah. Everybody, even the best players on tour, end up where they don't want to be at times. But it's the measure of these great players that they can scramble their way out. Contrary to what you might think, PGA Tour players often miss their target. And when they do, many come up with unorthodox solutions for recovery. They are the scramblers. There are some key ingredients that go into making a good scrambler. Big scramblers. Ben Crenshaw would have to be right up at the top of the list. I think Crenshaw comes to mind. Certainly Ben. Uh, Crenshaw is in that category. 
Yep, when it comes to finding solutions to tricky situations, few players compare. There are not very many players that can hit the ball left-handed, let alone hit it right-handed from there. But to hit that shot, that's one of the most miraculous shots I've ever seen in this situation. Yeah. That, that was a remarkable birdie. Well, the best I've seen is Seve. Obviously, um, nobody can do what he does. It was in the overgrown fields of Spain with only a makeshift three iron that a young Seve Ballesteros learned the game of golf. But it was from those humble beginnings that he learned to create a multitude of shots. Now I tell you, you just saw one of the best bunker shots you ever saw, Pat. That is some kind of talent. In his heyday, Tom Watson was one of the best of all time. Tom Watson, over the years, has gotten up and down some from places you're just not supposed to. Uh, Watson can do an awful lot of scrambling when he has to. Back then, he was very aggressive. Uh, he went at every flag, knowing that his short game, you know, the worst he's going to make is a par anywhere. He looked uh, very Jim, and if he, I don't know if he can get to the green. No, it looks like he got a great shot. Mm, absolutely. Golf's most dominant player in the late 70s and early 80s, Tom Watson was the master tactician. His terrific scrambling abilities have enabled him to capture 33 tour titles, including eight majors. Be a good scrambler, you have to have touch and imagination. Uh, You've got to be able to do a lot of different things with the wedge. You've got to be able to open it flat on its back. You've got to be able to close it down. You've got to be able to try to put spin on it. You've got to be able to put it up in the air, and take a full swing and hit it, hit it 10 feet. But perhaps the single biggest requirement for successful scrambling is a vivid imagination, creating a mental picture, and then having the confidence to hit it under pressure. What about that? Imagination plays a big part in scrambling. Uh, 